On April 17th, 2016, a good friend of mine named Jeremy Reynolds was called into a disciplinary, disciplinary council by his state president, Mark Ivins. Uh, he attended this court with the vain hope, vain slim little hope, that perhaps he could have a dialogue and maybe get some type of uh, official answers to some of his questions, or at least a response from the church. A little background about Jeremy. In early 2012, he uh, read a newspaper article, I believe, about some people who were leaving the church over um, some information that they would found that was troubling about church history. This prompted Jeremy to go on a bit of a fact-finding mission, as a lot of us do when we come up with this information, to verify and see what, what's actually going on. Uh, at first, like a lot of us, he was looking for faith-promoting answers and confident that they did exist. But as time goes on, he, found, he became frustrated and um, started to lose his testimony. His grandfather asked him to write down the problems he was having and put them in a letter, and he would give it to his friend of his, who was the a CES director. Now, CES stands for Church Education System, so this is kind of an official thing. Uh, Jeremy uh, wrote down his uh, questions in a letter, put it online to get some feedback to make sure that he, his information was accurate and that he wasn't in error, and sent it off to this director, who said it was a well-written letter, and they had to get back to him. And he never really did. Mark Ivins is a state president, so Jeremy went to him and asked him a few questions. And they had a little bit of a dialogue, and it kind of deteriorated, and over time they stopped talking. And Jeremy's testimony of the church, and even of Jesus Christ, uh, kind of fell by the wayside. Unknown to Mark Ivins, or the other members of the High Council, Jeremy recorded his disciplinary council, and put it on the web for all to see. So I figured I'd make a video that kind of gives my two cents about what happened. And my opinion on the overall scheme that the church has to deal with people who question. The reason for this council is that you are reported to be in apostasy and that you have repeatedly acted in clear, open, and deliberate public opposition to the church or its leaders. You have, among other things, published materials and participated in interviews which have attempted to discredit the church, publicly express your view that the church's scriptures are fraudulent, and express opposition to church leaders, including the prophet Joseph Smith. The definition of apostasy as defined in the handbook is repeatedly act in clear, open, deliberate public opposition to the church or its leaders. Can, My, you, fin can you finish the rest of the apostasy definition? I'm going to speak what I want to speak. Okay, okay. Thank you. Jeremy, do you admit or deny your participation in this conduct? I deny it. Okay. I deny it in the context of how you're framing it. Okay. You'll note that Jeremy really wanted his state president to read the, the entire definition of what apostasy is in the church. And we'll find out a little bit more of that later. But it's also interesting to note that um, Mark's not interested in having any kind of discussion or debate. He has something, he has prepared statements that he wants to say, and uh, that's all he's going to say. As part of your public, deliberate, open opposition to the church, you have published an 84 page document on a public internet site expressing opposition to core church doctrine, which you claim has been downloaded and shared over 100,000 times. This document is being translated into multiple languages. You are soliciting donations for its ongoing distribution and development. You have done multiple online recorded interviews broadcasting your views in opposition of church doctrine and its leaders. Now I think this is the real reason Jeremy was called in and being charged with apostasy is that he had questions, he found some uh, disturbing information, and after he, failing to get answers through official means, he published his stuff on the internet and expressed himself publicly, both his disbelief and the information that caused his disbelief. Um, that's a big no-no now in Morbism. You can't do that. Page 69 of your online document, you state your disbelief and opposition to the scriptures. Quote, to believe in the scriptures, I have to believe in a God who endorsed murder, genocide, rape, slavery, selling daughters into sex slavery, polygamy, child abuse, stoning disobedient children, pillage, plunder, sexism, racism, human sacrifice, animal sacrifice, killing people who work on the Sabbath, death, penalty for those who mix cotton with polyester, and so on. 
All of these things are in the Bible, except I couldn't quite find the death penalty for people who wear mixed fabrics. It's forbidden. I just didn't see that you had to be stoned or whatever. Mark, do you think people shouldn't object to these things? What Jeremy's doing is taking a moral stance, saying, look, I cannot excuse people's immorality by them saying that God told them to. You know, that's a crazy God that they're trying to sell me that would cause them to do these horrible immoral things. And I agree. Um, I don't think God commanded any of those immoral acts in the Old Testament. I think they were just men who were trying to cover up their own immorality by saying that it was God. Similar to how early church leaders did that with racism. Uh, they were racist against black people and uh, justified it by saying, eh, it was God that's racist. It's not us. This doesn't come from us. This is coming from a divine source. But they couldn't tell the difference, or they didn't want to tell the difference between their own racist ideas and bigotry and anything they were getting from a divine source. You and any person are welcome to your own conclusions and views. But when you create your own organization and begin to solicit others to point to your point of view, seeking to oppose the foundation doctrines of the church, you cross a boundary wherein you, you support and participate in direct opposition to the church. It is my opinion that you are, have repeatedly acted in clear and open, deliberate public opposition to the church and its leaders. But notice he doesn't say that he's wrong about anything that he says, or that he's wrong to even have those opinions. He says you're perfectly fine to do it. It's just speaking publicly about it. So this is a form of censorship. It's also interesting to me that this man who is supposed to be representing Jesus Christ and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. For the apostasy, he only talks about Jeremy's um, opposition, as it were, trying to discredit, which he's not, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It, it doesn't ask him anything about his testimonial relationship with Jesus Christ. Hey, uh, President Ivan, can you read the rest of the apostasy definition? Uh, like you read the definition, but there's more to it. I'd like you to make a statement. Okay, you're not going to answer that question? I'm not. Okay, um, my experience with uh, President Ivins, unfortunately, the past year and a half, is that he has never answered my questions. Not a single question. I have asked you three questions over and over and over and over and over and over and over 20 times. And the specific question that I asked you is, what errors or mistakes in the CES letter or on the website is incorrect so that I can publicly correct it. The second question I asked you is, if there are no errors or mistakes, why am I being punished for seeking and sharing the truth? And the third question I asked you is, what question am I being punished for? And you have not answered a single one of them. Can I ask you why you are not answering them? You're going to make a statement. So you're not going to answer any uh -huh. questions no. this evening? I've stated my evidence. You make a statement. Okay. Um, so do I have your... Um, would you agree that I... Uh, you make a statement, Jeremy. Why are you not answering any questions? This is not the time for that. I'm, when is the time? We're not going to get in debate. You're going to make a statement, period. I'm just going to make a statement. I, why, why won't you answer my questions? I've asked... I, and they're very reasonable questions that I've asked over and over. Like, I don't know what, if, if there are errors and mistakes, I want to correct them. I don't understand why you are spiritually executing me over something I don't know what's wrong. This is not how a court works, that there's no questions going to be answered, there's no participation there. It's quite clear Mark Ivins wants Jeremy to make a statement, be quiet, so he can go in the back and execute, excommunicate him, so he can go home and have his dinner while it's still hot. That's what I, Mark Ivins is mainly focused on here. He didn't answer Jeremy's questions in the past, and I'm not really sure why Jeremy would expect him to answer them now. If he had answers, if he really wanted to have an open and honest dialogue, he would have done so far before now, but at this point, I'm going to make a statement, you're going to make a statement, I'm just going to sit here and zone out, let me know when you're done, so I can excommunicate you so I can go home and have my dinner. It's very frustrating, like, it comes through in Jeremy's voice. Out of curiosity, by a show of hands, how many of you have read the church's essays? Nobody here? Okay. Um, by a show of hands, how many of you have read the CES letter? Nobody here tonight has read the CES letter? Wow. 
Wow. And uh, by a show of hands, as President Ivan's prepared you tonight for uh, this council by reading this yes letter carefully. Jeremy, you're going to make a statement. Okay. So, uh, no questions are going to be answered tonight. Um, this is crazy. I agree, this is crazy. They hadn't read the letter. They hadn't, they're not even aware of these issues, it seems. They haven't read the church's essays about them, which give a positive spin about hard and difficult things. But they don't even know why they're there. They're there because the state president said, we're going to go excommunicate this guy because this guy's guilty of apostasy. They didn't present them with any evidence. They didn't present them with any reasons other than what he said before. They didn't read it. They don't know the context of what Jeremy said or why he said it or the history of this whole thing. All they are is under orders to excommunicate this guy. This is a kangaroo court. Claims that you have made against me. There's not one thing that you've said that is it's not true or I'm claiming falsehood. He's just saying that I'm in opposition. This is very telling. He's not in opposition to God. He's not in opposition to Jesus. He's not op in opposition to factual information. He's not teaching anything that isn't true. He's just in opposition to what Mark Ivins thinks the sh church should be. Should it just be something where we pretend that these problems don't exist and that some things in the church that the church has taught uh, historically are factually incorrect and we just shouldn't pay attention to that? Does he not think that the sh church should ever change or correct problems that it's had? There's no reason the church can't correct course, as it's done a whole bunch of times in the past, and deal with these issues in a mature and honest way, and not kick out people who try to deal with these things in a mature and honest way. I have, a, I have sought official answers to church problems, and I've sought the answers for three years, and they never came. I've sought answers from you, President Ivins. We've had two meetings. First meeting was October 19th. You, we, we got to know each other, and you agreed to read the CS letter, and you read the CS letter, and I appreciate that. Then the next meeting we had was November 2nd. And in that meeting, I asked you to correct me and show me where the errors in the CES letter is so that, so that uh, I can publicly correct it. In the beginning of the meeting, you refused to, to do that. So um, I kept asking you to please correct me where it's incorrect so that I can publicly correct it. I am only interested in accurate information. I've had friends of mine who tell me that when a person has questions or objects to something, that they should go through official channels in the church in order to address those questions or issues. But here we see that Jeremy tried that, and it didn't get him anywhere. And in my experience, I tried that. And in other people I know's experiences, they've tried that. And you get a lot of um, BS answers that you should pray more, you should study more, you should read the scriptures, go to the temple, that type of thing. So, when you get ignored through official channels, what are you supposed to do if you have a concern you want to see change? Well, maybe you start a website. Maybe you put up your objections online on a forum. Maybe you do a whole bunch of really crappy YouTube videos. Who knows what you do? But, a lot of times people feel the need to express themselves and try to drive change in the church. And quite honestly, we got it. And there's a reason that the church has published essays that deal with these harder issues. There's a reason that the church redid the church uh, historical museum, or the church history museum. And that's because they cannot uh, whitewash the information like they have in the past anymore. And so I asked you to define apostasy for me. And you pulled out the church handbook of instruction. And there's a part in the church handbook of instruction where it outlines the different definition. You've had one of the definitions. You've had repeatedly act in clear, open, and deliberate public opposition to the church or its leaders. But you didn't read the second one. And the second one is possessed in teaching a church doctrine information that is not church doctrine after they have been corrected by their bishop or higher authority. Higher authority. And when you read that last sentence, your face and your demeanor shifted because you realize you have to correct me, that we can't go by your quote-unquote dark feelings. And so I asked you, correct me, please correct me, show me where the errors are. And you agreed to show me, not, you just said, not in that meeting, but I'll show you later where your errors and mistakes are. So it went from the beginning of the meeting, I'm not going to correct you in any way, I'm not getting into that. 
to where after you read this definition, you said, okay, I will show you the errors and mistakes. And you disappeared. I never heard back from you again. I know where Jeremy, Jeremy is going with this. He's putting the pressure back on the state president saying, you have to correct me. It's, you have a duty to, if I'm in error, to show me how I'm in error and correct me. And you need to do that before you charge me with apostasy. Um, of course, the definition is a, it's this or that. It doesn't have to be both of them. But you would think Ivan's wouldn't want to lose somebody like Jeremy, that he'd actually try to keep him around. And if he could find answers that were faith-promoting, that he would. I'm pretty sure that he couldn't find faith-promoting answers. Um, you can find ways to ignore issues or rationalize problems or conflicts, but to actually come up with faith-promoting answers to some of these questions, you can't do it. There's not a way to do that if you want to say that dark skin is a curse from God or something like that. I don't understand what I've done wrong. All I'm doing is ask, I, I went to official channels to seek answers to my doubts. And this was after a year of frustration with dealing with unofficial Mormon apologists. They are Mormon and all these guys who are no, no more legitimate or official than the crazy high priest guy that everybody rolls their eyes to in Sunday school. I was tired of them. I wanted official answers from a church. So I went, to, I went through official channels to get them, the CES director. I went through, went through, uh, through you to get answered. And the, the, and the only thing I get in return is threats of best communication. That's because there aren't any faith-promoting answers, Jeremy. Um, how do you... And I, my last video was on uh, polygamy and how Joseph Smith violated the terms of polygamy over and over and over and over again by marrying women who were not virgins, who had a husband, and that his wife didn't know about, and that made it adultery. And he did that dozens of times. There's not a faith-promoting answer to that. I was hoping for a dialogue tonight. I was hoping to be able to ask my questions and get answers. But it's obvious that I'm not going to get anything tonight. That this is not a real trial. It's not a real... Like, as far as I'm concerned, this is a kangaroo court. As far as I'm concerned, I mean, you guys are not interested in helping me. Isn't that sad? They're not interested in helping him at all. They're there to discipline him for speaking out and expressing himself. They're not interested in helping him come closer to God or find a place in the church for those who doubt or disbelieve. That needs to change. I don't know how to repent of the truth. Amen to that. I want to read a couple quotes. If a faith will not bear to be investigated, if its preachers and professors are afraid to have it, have it examined, their foundation must be very weak. George Abba Smith. Truth has no fear of the light. If an individual or organization seeks to silence doubt or questioning in the private room or in the town square, it is filled with fear and its house is built on sand. And if we have the truth, no harm can come from investigation. If we have not the truth, it ought to be harmed. President J. Reuben Coy. Hubie Brown. Now I have mentioned freedom of expression, mentioned freedom to express your thoughts, but I caution you that your thoughts and expressions must meet competition in the marketplace of thought. And in that comp competition, truth will emerge triumphant. Only error needs to fear freedom of expression. These are ideas that are all baked into the skin of Mormonism. The whole plan of salvation was about to come to earth, learn, grow, and progress. You can't do that without questioning or seeking answers or challenging what you think you already know. Um, if Joseph Smith had done that, if he had not questioned the teachings of the time, if he had just been obedient and gone along with uh, subjecting himself to religious authority of the day, he never would have started the church. He never would have asked the questions. He never would have had the sacred grove moment. The entire church is a monument to questioning, asking, not settling for little answers or no answers, but pushing ourselves to find and learn more and to grow. That's baked into Mormonism. It's the main part of Mormonism. There needs to be place in the church for people who follow those creeds and 
search for truth, not just those who bow their head, say yes, and pray, pay, and obey. So I'm going to respond real quick to your accusations. One, you pub published materials or participated in interviews which have attempted to discredit the church. I'm not discrediting the church. The church's essays are discrediting the church. It's not me that's discrediting him. It's facts. These are not anti-Mormon lies. It's amazing to me. What was yesterday's anti-Mormon lies and now today's church essays? Very true. When I had uh, my doubts, I wrote a paper that I shared uh, with my priesthood leaders, and they told me that they were all anti-Mormon lies that they'd heard for 30 years or so. Uh, then several years later, the church comes out with essays that validate every single one of those concerns that I had. It puts a positive spin on them, but they're not anti-Mormon lies. They're actually factual problems. So to say that yesterday's anti-Mormon lies are today's church essays, it's very true. And to say that the essays discredit the church, they do. They discredit the old narrative that the church has perpetuated for generations. Jeremy didn't cause any of these problems. He didn't commit polygamy. He didn't sleep with 14-year-old girls or other men's wives. He didn't uh, translate uh, some papyrus incorrectly and then claim that God told him to. He didn't, do any, he didn't create any of these problems. He's trying to deal with them. He was trying to find faithful answers to these problems to keep his faith. He was, you don't fight like this unless that's what you were trying to do. That should not be an excommunicatable offense. So I was trying to resolve these doubts and concerns. I was seeing this information. I was trying to resolve it by writing the letter to the CES director. It was not my intention to destroy the church or to take people out of the church. It still is not my intention. If people are happy in the church, awesome, fantastic. I agree with Jeremy on this. There are people who are really, really happy in the church and that do a lot of good for their fellow man and their community and their ward in the church, and they should stay there. There's a lot of good, faithful, wonderful people in Mormonism that should be part of Mormonism. I want it to succeed and become something better than it is because Almost everybody I work with and most of my family are part of the church. And I want the church to be a better thing. And I want people who the church works for to stay in it, make it better. I do want them to question. I do want them to push for change and not just run on automatic and not think. But if it works for you, stay. Life is hard. And if you have something that helps you, stay in it. It's okay. It's okay to leave, too. You don't have to stay, and you shouldn't stay for anybody but yourself. But if it works for you, stay with it. I, I stand today with my head held high. I'm morally clean. And I have a clear conscience that I have done nothing wrong. So, because you guys are not answering my questions, and you guys have not answered my questions the last three years, it is very clear to me that the church does not have answers to a truth crisis. The church does not like individuals asking questions about his truth claims. So, this is a kangaroo court. I'm done with this court. President, I am as communicating the LDS church, I am as communicating you, and I am as communicating this kangaroo court for my life. Here is my resignation letter. Goodbye. Bam! Out like a boss, Jeremy. I love it. But Jeremy, I'm proud of you. You showed a lot of balls. A lot of guts in doing what you did. And you didn't let them excommunicate you. You did it on your terms. You did it. You took your own power. And you owned it. And everybody in our other church, you own your own experience. You own your own life. You own your own relationship with the church and other people. What you did was a very brave thing, Jeremy. I'm glad you're my friend. I'm glad we've been able to talk for a few years now and, and meet a couple of times in person. You're a good guy. And I wish you and your family nothing but the best.